Hi, my name is Graham Allison, and it's a great honor for me to welcome uh, you to the forum of Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government for a very special forum event sponsored jointly by the Program on Negotiation at the Harvard Law School, the Mideast Institute, and the Center for Science and International Affairs at the Kennedy School. Our guest tonight is Jan Eglund, State Secretary of Norway. Mr. Eglund will speak about Norway's role in facilitating the secret peace talks between Israel and the PLO, talks that led to the signing of the Oslo Declaration of Principles in August of 1993. And as they say, the rest is uh, history, a history that is uh, unfolding every day. Uh, Mr. Eglin worked with uh, Johan Holst, uh, the late uh, minister of uh, Norway, who was a great uh, friend and a colleague of many of us here, and with Johan was one of the initiators of what has come to be called in the literature the Norway Channel. He's therefore able to give us a first-hand account of that insider's peace process. He's also an individual who's written on the role that small states can play in helping to resolve international disputes. And I think we will here be very interested in his highlighting for us the ways in which uh, they were able to make some essential breakthroughs and to, to, to discuss the implications of the Norwegian experience for the practice of international conflict resolution. Uh, Mr. Eglin has been State Secretary of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs since February of 1992. Prior to that, he held positions as political advisor to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, head of the International Department of the Norwegian Red Cross, research coordinator for the Durant Institute in Geneva, and a radio and television news reporter with the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. Mr. Eglin's a graduate of the University of Oslo, where he received a master's degree in political science. He's held research fellowships at the University of California, Berkeley, the Truman Institute in Jerusalem, and the International Peace Research Institute in Oslo. He's also published a number of articles and books, including one uh, that I know a number of people here have used called Impotent Superpower, Potent Small State. Uh, so to uh, tell us tonight about uh, the Norwegian Channel and this uh, impetus in international conflict resolution, let's welcome Mr. Eglin. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Allison. It's an honor to be here. Sometimes real life events are even more amazing than fiction. At least this was the feeling of three small groups who were gathered in the government's guest house in Oslo on the night of the 19th to the 20th of August, 1993. The main participants were four Israeli and three Palestinian peace negotiators hosted by a Norwegian negotiating team of four. The evening of 19th of August opened with an official dinner hosted by our late foreign minister and former Harvard student, Johann Jürgen Holst, in honor of his Israeli counterpart, Shimon Peres. The conversation revolved around general Norwegian-Israeli ties, but those of us who knew what was to happen after the dinner guests had taken their leave could think of nothing else. Just after midnight, the Norwegian National Security Police escorted the Palestinian and Israeli negotiating teams in the back way. They brought with them the final agreed version of the Declaration of Principles, signaling peace at last between Israel and the PLO. The last point of contention had been resolved only hours before at what was the 14th secret round of negotiations in Oslo. At one o'clock in the morning, Mr. Peres, with his advisors and security guards, rejoined the small group after an hour's rest in his room downstairs, he was present as an observer when the two heads of ne the negotiating teams, Abu Allah of the PLO and Uri Savir of the Israeli Foreign Ministry, initialed the historic Declaration of Principles. A greeting from Chairman Arafat was read aloud. 
No more than 20 people were present, many of whom had regarded one another as enemies only a few months before. This was a dream come true because no one had reason to believe that the modest confidence-building measures and academic contacts we planned back in 1991 and 1992 would become the prelude to a joint Israeli-Palestinian declaration of principles in 1993. The following day, the two parties sat down quietly again at the negotiating table in Oslo, this time to start work on an agreement that was equally revolutionary, the declaration of mutual recognition between Israel and the PLO, which was to transform the two parties from enemies into neighbors. This was followed by further rounds of secret negotiations in Oslo and Paris, and a new decisive, uh, and as new decisive elements in the peace process fell into place and ultimately led to Minister Holst's remarkable shuttle diplomacy with the actual letters of recognition between Prime Minister Rabin and Chairman Arafat. Some three weeks after the secret ceremony in Oslo, the group from the Norway Channel had swollen to 3,000 people who attended the highly public signing of the Declaration of Principles in front of the White House in Washington. Yishak Rabin and Yasser Arafat shook hands before the eyes of millions of astonished television viewers. We witnessed the reconciliation of two men who had been the very symbol of enmity and hostility. The five-year framework agreement on Palestinian self-government in Gaza and the West Bank was analyzed and discussed throughout the world. Commentators asked, whether the agreement could survive at all. Would an agreement negotiated in absolute secrecy be accepted at all by Israeli and Palestinian public opinion? Many wondered how the Palestinians and Israelis could agree to postpone negotiations on such fundamental controversial questions as the status of Jerusalem and the Jewish settlements in the occupied territories for two years. And how did Norway, of all places, as Time magazine put it, come to be in the center of such an international political drama? To answer this last question, we must go back in time. It is in our recent history that we find the primary reason why a small country such as Norway became involved in the peace process by winning the confidence of both parties. The Norwegian people were deeply shocked when they learned the truth about the fate of the Norwegian Jews during the Holocaust. Many felt that more could have been done for their Jewish neighbors during the Nazi occupation of our country. And Norway used her position in the UN to advocate the establishment of Israel in 1948. There was a particularly close ideological affinity between the labor parties of the two countries. The society developed by David Ben-Gurion was seen as part of the same form of democratic socialism as Norwegian social democracy. Close personal ties grew up between leading politicians such as Golda Meir and our Norwegian party secretary, Håkon Lee. However, after Israel's occupation of the West Bank in Gaza in 1967, a growing number of Norwegians felt our policies were too indiscriminately pro-Israeli and lacked solidarity with the Palestinian people. Among those who urged that a better balance should be found were Foreign Minister Knut Friedenlund and his State Secretary at the time, Torvald Stoltenberg. In the late 1970s and early 1980s, when Friedenlund advocated that Arafat should speak in the UN, he met Arafat face to face and permitted the PLO to open an office in Oslo, he encountered strong opposition even within our own Labour Party. Nevertheless, the rapprochement between Norway and the PLO continued with regular top-level contacts between the leaders of Norway and the PLO leadership. For a long time, our own fundamentalists took turns criticizing our close contact with either the Israeli occupying forces 
or the Palestinian terrorists. It probably seems paradoxical to these same fundamentalists that it was Norway's close ties with Israel that made Norway so interesting for the PLO. Conversely, our direct contact with Yasser Arafat made Israel choose us as their back channel. There were countries with even closer contact with the PLO than Norway, and there were others which were less critical of Israel than us, but these relations often lacked the extra dimension that Norway had. Several PLO delegations visited Oslo in 1991 and 1992 and asked for Norwegian facilitation of direct contact with Israel at meetings with Foreign Minister Stoltenberg and myself. Delegations included Faisal Husseini and Hanan Ashrawi from the territories, and Nabil Shad, Abu Allah, and Abu Sharif from the PLO headquarters in Tunis. Abu Allah was soon to become secret negotiators, in fact, much sooner than he expected. When the Social Democratic government in Sweden lost the elections in 1991, the outgoing foreign minister, Sten Andersson, a close PLO contact, advised Chairman Arafat that Norway could perhaps serve as a channel to the Israelis, just as the Swedes earlier had tried to facilitate contact between the US and the PLO. Our contact with Israel was also renewed and intensified at the beginning of the 1990s. A new generation of Israeli doves had grown up within the Israeli Labour Party, which won the elections in June 1992 with a clear peace mandate. After years of difficult negotiations, the US, with admirable skills, managed in 1991 to convince Israel and all its enemies, Jordan, Syria, Lebanon, and the Palestinians, to agree on official bilateral and multilateral peace talks. But from their inception in Madrid in late 1991, Israel had vetoed PLO members and Jerusalem residents to participate in the actual peace talks. Together with the director of the Norwegian Trade Union Research Center, FAFO, Terry Röd Larsen, and my colleague, Mona Yul, I offered the new Israeli Deputy Foreign Minister, Yossi Balin, in Tel Aviv in September 1992, help in establishing a secret channel to the PLO. We were able to provide the perfect camouflage for such a channel, the extensive standard of living studies carried out by FAFO in the West Bank and Gaza. Until January 1993, it was prohibited for Israelis, as well as Americans, to have any contact with the PLO. Nevertheless, Mr. Balin realized that there had to be unofficial contact between the parties. He and certain other Israeli labor politicians understood that the real Palestinian power base, the PLO, should sooner or later become a responsible partner in face-to-face -face negotiations. The official formula meant that the PLO controlled the negotiating teams without identifying with them. The result was no progress at the bargaining table in the official Middle East negotiations that had started in Madrid and continued in Washington. After further contact between Röd Larsen, the Norwegian Foreign Office, and our Israeli and Palestinian contacts, Norway was accepted as a possible secret facilitator to support and complement the public official Washington negotiations. Two courageous Israeli academics, Yair Heshfeld and Ron Pundak, who had personal links to Yossi Balin, arrived for the first three meetings in January, February, and March 1993. The Minister of, the, of Economy, as he was called, of the PLO, Abu Allah, was joined by two colleagues from the staff of Chairman Arafat and Abu Mazen, respectively. A secluded mansion in Salzburg, Norway, was the venue for the first meetings. The two teams 
determined to break away from the tradition set by earlier Israeli-Palestinian talks and most Jewish Arab discussions so far, agreed not to dwell on the past. I remember both sides saying during the very first meeting, if we are to quarrel about the historic rights to these holy lands, about who was there first or about who betrayed whom and when, we will sit here quarreling forever. We must agree to look to the future. Abu Allah, Hirschfeld, and Pundak were all experts in the field of eco economy and development, and their no-nonsense, pragmatic approach soon produced results. A detailed plan for the development of Gaza and the West Bank took shape, including provisions for refugee housing, a Gaza harbor, electrification, and numerous other infrastructure initiatives. They agreed on bilateral regional development plans detailing economic cooperation between Israelis and Palestinians and between Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and their common Arab neighbors. Both sides recommended new sessions in Norway. I therefore asked for and got the consent to inform the State Department official in charge of the Washington negotiations about the Norwegian talks. Using a safe phone from the American Embassy in Oslo, I gave several briefings of the progress in our channel. The US response was supportive but cautious. As long as there is a congressional ban on all direct contact between the US and the PLO, we cannot take part in your talks but appreciate being informed of your progress, they told me. After the second Salzburg meeting in February, a rough draft paper had already been drawn up. After the third session and seclusion of the Norwegian country house, the two teams agreed on a draft declaration of principles, which included many elements which can be found in the final signed agreement. We were amazed and elated. The academic contact point which we had established had a potential of far greater significance than had originally been planned. However, the Subspock paper had one major drawback. There was still no official backing from the Israeli government side. It took two more months, April and May, to secure the support of Foreign Minister Shimon Peres and to gain approval from Prime Minister Yisha Rabin to continue the negotiations with official backing. Again, my colleague Yossi Balin proved instrumental. He presented the draft to the two leaders and said he felt this was Israel's chance to reach a viable peace agreement with the de facto Palestinian leadership, Yasser Arafat's PLO. And two distinctive features of the secret draft intrigued Mr. Rabin and Mr. Peres. Firstly, the, nego the negotiators in Salzburg had agreed to disagree on the status of Jerusalem and the Israeli settlements in the occupied territories. Discussions on these two issues were deferred to a later stage when it was hoped that the neighboring peoples would have developed mutual trust by learning to cooperate peacefully. Secondly, Palestinian self-rule and Israeli withdrawal would be introduced gradually, with self-rule starting, starting in Gaza and subsequently being expanded to the West Bank. Later, Jericho was added to the initial self-rule arrangement. Similar discussions took place in what the Palestinians described as the Arafat kitchen in Tunis. Only five Palestinian leaders participated including Chairman Arafat, Abu Mazen, and Abu Allah. For the Palestinian leadership, Israel's willingness to initiate direct talks with the PLO was a breakthrough as it meant a de facto recognition of the organization as the legitimate representative of the Palestinians. So were the provisions that the PLO could start to govern at least parts of Palestinian territory immediately and that there would be a substantial international presence in the areas as Israeli forces withdrew. 
The Director General of the Israeli for Foreign Ministry, Uri Savir, was sent to Oslo in May to test the seriousness of Abu Allah and his two colleagues. Uri Savir was impressed and strongly recommended official negotiations directed towards a full declaration of principles through the Norwegian Channel. It was, however, more vital than ever that there were no leaks. Mr. Savir insisted that we never use public hotels for the negotiations, nor use his or the other Israelis' real name, not even when booking VIP facilities at the airport. When the official negotiations started in June, the Israeli delegation consisted of Mr. Savir, Hirschfeld, Pundak, and Joel Singer, an Israeli lawyer who had participated in the Camp David talks and had the full confidence of both Rabin and Peres. We used a 200-year-old house belonging to the Oslo municipality, which we needed, which said, for internal foreign ministry seminars. As I prepared to leave the ministry to join this first meeting of the official negotiators, a press spokesman rushed into my office with a dispatch from Agence France Presse's Washington correspondent, claiming that there were, were secret Norwegian uh, negotiations between Israel and the PLO. My God, Jan, what have you been doing, he said. I told him to inform the Norwegian and international press that the AFP story probably was based on a misunderstanding as it referred to a multilateral meeting on Palestinian refugees in Oslo in May that was part of the official US-sponsored peace process. At the house, I first met with Savir and Hirschfeld. They read through the AFP story, which quoted anonymous State Department sources, and said, I think we can deal with this but don't tell the Palestinians since the negotiations are making good progress. Ten minutes later, I gave the same dispatch to Abu Allah, who very calmly said that he knew the story had appeared and that he had already instructed Tunis on how to deal with it. But don't show it to the Israelis, he said. They will only become more nervous and the negotiations are making good progress. Although the two heads of delegations, Uri Savir and Abu Allah, used the long, luminous Norwegian summer nights to develop a unique personal relationship of trust and mutual respect, the two encountered increasing problems at the declaration was approaching its final form. L'heure de vérité had come. Rabin Peres and Arafat Dabou Mazen were following the negotiations closely and imposed increasingly strict negotiations mandates. Their goals were simple. These Israelis wanted a maximum of security for all its citizens indefinitely. The Palestinians wanted a maximum of self-rule and development immediately. Already in July, we experienced the first apparently total breakdown of the negotiations. Due to our concern for secrecy and security, we had rented a large farmhouse some 300 kilometers north of Oslo and brought the Norwegian security police for a session we hoped would be the final breakthrough. The local owners were told that we would bring in a group of eccentric Middle Eastern academics working around the clock to finish a book. Terry Rud Larsen, Mona Yul, and I spent the night on the farm hoping that the last piece of the puzzle would fit together before the night was over. Instead, the two teams broke off their talks at 5 a.m. and asked to be brought to the airport. When the owners of the farmhouse awoke to prepare breakfast for us, we had all gone. After both teams had left Oslo to report home, we did not know whether there would be new negotiations at all. But several new frustrating sessions in July and August were proof of a willingness of the two leaderships to run the entire marathon. With the help of our late foreign minister, Johann Jürgen Holst, 
who secretly met with Mr. Perez in Stockholm on o August 13th to have a six-hour telephone meeting with Yasser Arafat in Tunis, some of the final points of contentions were cleared. And on the night of the 19th of August, the Declaration of Principles was finally signed. Eight months had elapsed since the first session in January. Our secret meetings proved to have several advantages over traditional conference diplomacy. Firstly, the news media, which tend to focus on what divides rather than on what unites, were not involved. As a former news reporter and a strong believer in free speech and open societies, I was struck by how disrupted the constant and immediate news coverage was at official peace conferences. As soon as the delegates arrived in Washington or other official venues, journalists would confront them with the more hostile comments made by the opposing side, thus leading to even more aggressive responses. This was equally evident when for six weeks in 1993, I served as a deputy to the UN and EU mediators for the former Yugoslavia, Torvald Stoltenberg and Lord Oven. Secondly, there was no time consuming diplomatic protocol to be followed and no speeches to the gallery. The participants in the official public sessions appeared to spend almost 100% of their time blaming one another, whereas the negotiators in Norway spent at least 90% of their waking hours, meals included, in real negotiations. Even the many mutual provocations and acts of violence in the field did not hamper the efforts of the secret negotiators as they did the official channel in Washington. Thirdly, an atmosphere of mutual trust and affinity could gradually develop between people who spent hundreds of hours working, eating, quarreling, and joking together in front of Norwegian fireplaces and surrounded only by the peaceful countryside. Fourthly, close cooperation with the non-governmental organization, FAFO, enabled us to offer the parties deniability, the opportunity, if necessary, to deny that anything official had happened. If anything leaked, we would explain the meetings as academic seminars or as Norwegian participation in the official peace process. The small size of our team also helped us to keep things quiet. The team spirit enabled us to offer flexible and effective facilities for our Palestinian and Israeli friends who were never particularly precise about who would arrive when or for how long. We were prepared to keep our secret forever if the negotiations broke down. This was important because both sides feared that it might have disastrous results at home if the news of secret negotiations in Oslo were to be leaked before a possible agreement. Farful studies of living conditions were the ideal official explanation for the many visits to Oslo from Tunis and Israel that would otherwise have aroused suspicion. The process culminating in the Oslo Agreement and the subsequent Cairo negotiations have been dramatic, but the results so far are no less amazing. Gaza and Jericho are now autonomous areas with an independent Palestinian administration. Palestinian policemen have taken over the streets from the Israeli army, and Yasser Arafat has come home at last. Under the early empowerment scheme, the Palestinian administration is now responsible for education and health also for the rest of the West Bank, minus Jerusalem and settlements, meaning that Palestinians are educating their own children for the first time in history. Two weeks ago, the PLO and Israel agreed to set 1st of July as a target date for an agreement on expanding Palestinian self-rule. This signals that the peace process is able to regain its momentum despite serious setbacks, the worst being terrorist attacks and massacres in which extremists have killed both civilian Israelis and Palestinians. 
During the course of the, the negotiations, the parties have often commended Norway. However, there is reason to emphasize that our role during the process that led to the Declaration of Principles was primarily that of the facilitator. The credit for achieving an agreement goes entirely to the parties themselves, their courageous leaders, and their able negotiators. We were merely the midwives with no claim to parenthood as regards the text of the agreement. The parties must therefore also shoulder the main responsibility for following up the agreement. However, this does not make Norway's present or future role any less active. We still receive frequent requests to coordinate international assistance, international meetings, and coordinate neutral observers to the areas. Norway is presently concentrating her efforts on mobilizing and streamlining international assistance to the Palestinians. This is a sine qua non for the success of the peace process. Norway holds the chairmanship of the donor consortium, which are providing financial support to the Palestinian self-government. The world community has pledged more than two billion US dollars in such assistance for the five-year period covered by the Oslo Agreement. However, the disbursement of assistance is slow, and the present economic situation in the Palestinian self-rule areas remains extremely difficult. Living conditions for ordinary Palestinians appear to be deteriorating. Unemployment is widespread. The economic problems have been further aggravated by the Israeli closure of the West Bank and Gaza borders to Palestinian workers after terrorist attacks on Israeli civilians. In addition, the local revenue collection in the Palestinian areas have been weaker than expected. Against this background, there is an urgent need for action to improve economic and social conditions for ordinary Palestinians. Most Palestinians are under 20 years. They have experienced nothing but foreign domination and occupation. They will believe that peace is better than war only when they can feel it and see it in terms of jobs, homes, and protection of basic human rights. The donor community has agreed on a plan that concentrates on efforts to promote labor-intensive public works. Donor efforts cannot, however, be a permanent solution to these economic and social challenges. We must promote conditions which will enable the people of the region to engage in free and fair trade with their own products. Current international aid to the Palestinians is only the first step towards that end. Norway has also become closely involved in the pro problems associated with water supplies throughout the Middle East. The demand for water in the region will far outstrip sustainable supply with the present patterns of consumption. Too little water and too many people will pose, may pose a greater threat to peace in the future than any ideological or religious hostility. Gaza faces the most serious water shortage in the region. The groundwater is sinking and becoming increasingly salty. All countries in the region will, however, face acute water shortages if a regional water management scheme is not established soon. We have therefore initiated a regional discussion group consisting so far of Israel, Jordan, and the PLO to work on possible regional guidelines for water management legislation and administration. We have to recognize that there is no quick solution for the water shortage. Any solution which is considered will necessitate careful planning, painstaking negotiations, and political decision making. Another prerequisite for achieving lasting peace is solving the refugee problem. It is especially important to find ways of assisting Palestinian refugees living outside the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. We have consistently emphasized the need for a regional perspective in our efforts to improve the living conditions of the Palestinian refugees, and we are currently carrying out standards of living surveys that will eventually provide a comprehensive picture of the situation of Palestinian refugees in the entire Middle East. 
When we have a complete scientific database, negotiations aimed at the permanent solution of the refugee problem may be facilitated. The peace process has a long way to go, and at times it is easy to be somewhat disheartened. Both the Israeli Labour Party and the PLO has lost ground to the hawks on both sides. Pessimists are predicting renewed confrontation, which would result in further uncertainty and repression. It is therefore important to bear in mind that, just as the negotiations process was through various phases and setbacks, implementation of the agreement is bound to meet with difficulties. We must not forget the progress that progress is being made towards peace throughout the Middle East. The Gordian knot is finally being untied. Peace has at last been given a chance, and the Middle East will never be the same again. Thus, the Middle East could become a model for the resolution of conflicts in other parts of the world, a model that is more sorely needed than ever before. The Norwegian Channel demonstrated how a small country with no aspirations of changing its status can bring parties to a conflict together for talks when they are reluctant or unable to reach compromises through the cumbersome, highly publicized process of conference diplomacy. All democratic countries have an obligation to strengthen their ability to respond when democratic and peace-oriented initiatives call for urgent support. Our common ability to provide flexible, speedy, and effective assistance to those at humanity's first line of defense will also determine our ability to protect and promote our own collective security. Our, our experience is that we have a vast, untapped reservoir of relevant resources and expertise in our governmental and non-governmental organizations. Non-governmental groups prove to have the best access to people and networks that can be mobilized quickly. Many NGOs have long experience of working with government agencies. They are knowledgeable about government requirements, specifications, and budget procedures. They can operate in a very flexible manner. Decisions can be decentralized and operations can be started more quickly. Private groups can recruit personnel on the basis of short-term contracts and standby agreements. They, are all, they often are able to track down key personnel whom the government might not even know existed. Considerable resources can be deployed often within hours, and NGOs frequently display impressive creativity in solving practical problems. To utilize these resources, we have established the Norwegian Emergency Preparedness System, NOREPS, and the Norwegian Resource Bank for Democracy and Human Rights, NORDEM. These are flexible standby arrangements with a number of governmental and non-governmental organizations. This close cooperation between voluntary organizations, academic institutions, and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is in humanitarian action and peace work is sometimes referred to as the Norwegian model. There are 100 NGOs receiving government funding for development assistance and human rights activities in more than 100 countries. Over the years, thousands of Norwegians have acquired field experience from working with these organizations as well as with the government development agency, NORAD. It is estimated that the number are now about equal to the 1% of our population, some 43,000, who have participated in UN peacekeeping operations. These people are a great resource which Norway is tapping for conflict preventive measures on a rapid deployment basis. Of the 100 NGOs, five represent a core group. These are the Refugee Council, the Red Cross, Norwegian People's Aid, Norwegian Church Aid, and save the children. Through the standby procedures, NOREPS and NORDEM, more than 500 relief workers, human rights advisors, and peace mediators and observers were dispatched last year to more than 30 countries in Africa, Asia, Latin America, Europe, and the Middle East. At the request of UN agency, newborn democracies, and parties to armed 
conflicts. Through the standby procedures, Norway has quietly, and on the party's own term, also been able to facilitate three parallel peace processes in addition to the Middle East, in Guatemala, in the former Yugoslavia, and most recently in Sri Lanka. On the 3rd of January, the Sri Lankan government and the Tamil Tigers, the LTTE, jointly requested Norway, along with the Netherlands and Canada, to direct the supervision of the ceasefire which entered into force the following weekend. Within 24 hours, details of nine qualified Norwegian candidates were presented in Colombo, and 36 hours after being selected by the parties, our first NGO recruited peace monitors were airborne for Sri Lanka. The task was thus subcontracted to the NGOs, in this case, the Norwegian Refugee Council. Today, the observers are active in the field, receiving reports from the parties and meeting with government officials and the Tamil Tiger leadership. However, due to differences between the parties, the bipartisan observer committees that we were supposed to lead have not yet been able to start operating. The peace process seems to have run into difficulties on the question of the final status of the Tamil controlled areas. But there are indications that the government and the LTTE soon might agree on ways and means to steer the negotiations out of the present deadlock. The peace process in Guatemala was initiated in Norway in March 1990 when representatives of the Government Peace Commission and the guerrilla movement, URNG, signed the Oslo Agreement, which established a format and an agenda for negotiations. Today, exactly five years later, there is still an armed conflict in Guatemala, but through the good offices of the UN and the so-called Group of Friends, Mexico, Spain, the US, Venezuela, Colombia, and Norway, Efforts are being made to achieve a final peace accord before the end of the year. As in the Middle East peace process, Norway has tried to assist Guatemala through a close cooperation between the foreign ministry and two NGOs, the Norwegian Church Aid and the Lutheran World Federation. Since 1990, we have provided financial support to the guerrilla to enable them to participate meaningfully in the negotiations. At the same time, Norway developed as development assistance to Guatemala, mainly channeled through non-governmental organizations, has been increased. We hosted the round of negotiations in June 1994, which resulted in agreements on repatriation of displaced persons and on a truth commission to investigate past atrocities. Norway has also made a point of trying to influence and reform the Guatemalan armed forces, which have a long history of human rights abuse and of military coups. Military delegations from Guatemala have visited Norway, and high-ranking Norwegian military officers, led by the former chairman of the NATO Military Committee, General Viglaik Eide, have visited Guatemala the Norwegian generals convincingly told the military leadership of Guatemala that their only chance of taking part in modern international military cooperation was by ending their Stone Age War, a brutal conflict that was a product of the Cold War but still takes the lives of thousands of innocent peoples, mostly Maya Indians, every year. 1995 is a crucial year for the peace process in Guatemala. We believe that a peace agreement should be signed before a new president is elected at the end of the year. The UN and international community must apply friendly pressure on the parties to the conflict to take advantage of the opportunity for peace which is offered to them through the international support of the peace process and the deployment of the UN Human Rights mission in Guatemala. It is also extremely important that the Guatemalan people participate in the upcoming ballot in order to elect a new president committed to peace and a national assembly which better reflects 
the social, economic, and ethnic realities of the country. In the former Yugoslavia, Norway is again making an effort to be supportive of the UN mediation and peacekeeping measures. In addition to our peacekeeping forces, we have, through our two standby arrangements, provided hundreds of relief workers for the UN, the International Red Cross, and other organizations. Not as well known, but equally important, is the personnel we have provided on short notice for the UN and EU co-chairman Torvald Stoltenberg and David Owen. The authorities in Belgrave gave in, into foreign pressure and decided to impose internationally monitored sanctions on the Bosnian Serbs in September last year. We provided at Stoltenberg's and Owen's request 20 observers for deployment along the Serbian-Montenegro borders within 48 hours. The work of this mission is essential for credible sanctions against the Bosnian Serbs, inducing them to accept the peace plan of the contact group, which has been accepted by the Muslim and Croat forces. There are many similar examples. Technical problems often have a tendency to become political, but the presence of impartial experts can help the parties towards a solution. In January, we provided an expert on electoral power within 24 hours to help the Croats and the Serbs in the Krajina to implement the agreement on socioeconomic issues they had signed in December last year concerning the joint use of a hydropower dam and the electricity grid. The main mediator in those negotiations was Ambassador Kai Eide, who has been seconded to the UN by the Norwegian government. In conclusion, what lessons have we learned from our experience in attempting to facilitate peace on different continents and under different circumstances? First and most basically, there will be no real peace if the parties themselves are not willing to make efforts towards peace, as illustrated by the recent withdrawal of the UN and the US forces from Somalia. Real and lasting peace cannot be imposed from abroad. Either the Israelis, the Palestinians, or both have aborted all previous attempts to reach a peaceful settlement. In the Israeli-Palestinian peace channel, we were fortunate to be in a position to offer our services at the precise moment in history when the leadership of both sides genuinely wanted peace. The reason there is still no peace in Guatemala or the former Yugoslavia is that at least one of the parties is not yet interested in pursuing peace on the terms that appear logical even to the outsider. Second, even when the conflicting parties are willing to make peace, an inadequate mediation machinery and an absence of secret back channels may thwart even the best of ambitions. Israel and the PLO were able to effect negotiations and agreements themselves as soon as we managed to establish a link between the PLO leadership with the Israeli government in secrecy, but also in an environment of trust. Third, all affected populations stand to lose in a prolonged conflict. But mediators are wise to realize that the leaders involved do not necessarily consider it to be in their best interest to make peace. On the Balkans, in Central America, in the Middle East and elsewhere, military and political elites traditionally derive their power by presiding over confrontation, aggression, or defense. Peace and democratic elections may mean new leadership and a new allocation of power. The three Nobel laureates, Mr. Rabin, Mr. Peres, and Mr. Arafat, clearly underwent a transformation from old-style confrontational behavior to a deep conviction in the mutual benefits of peace. Fourth, to negotiate peace when there is no clear victor 
means entering into compromises which are bound to be costly in terms of public support at home. In both democratic societies and authoritarian systems, Daoish leaderships often lose support to more hawkish attitudes. And activists in the street, in guerrilla commands, or even in democratically elected parliaments are often less conciliatory than their own leaders. Fifth, during a peace process, there are always internal tensions and quarrels within the parties, which often are as difficult to resolve as the main negotiations between the two parties. When inexplicable delays occur, it is often the result of the tug of wars behind the scene in which the relative strength between the doves and the hawks change as the negotiation process continues. Six, preventive action requires early action to become effective action. We have seen that international assistance can preserve peace save lives and protect human rights and democracy if it reaches vulnerable communities in time. Too often we have been passive observers while unique opportunities are lost because we as individual nations or UN members did not mobilize resources in time. It happened last year in Rwanda. It may happen soon in neighboring Burundi. Too often our response mechanisms have proved to be inadequate for the early needs of embattled democracies, of peace initiatives, or of disaster-prone and vulnerable communities. Whether Norway again will facilitate peace agreements between conflicting parties is an open question. Perhaps only one in a hundred attempts will succeed. Still, it will be worth the effort. As the students of Paris said in 1968, be realistic, demand the impossible. Thank you very much. So uh, we have a little time for uh, questions and comments and uh, contrary statements. There are uh, microphones here on the left and the right. Uh, we've come to hear Minister Eglin, and so we don't want any long speeches uh, to the contrary, but a comment with a question is permitted. And please identify yourself before putting the question, because this is recorded for uh, National Public Radio. Please. Uh, my name is Riyad Nasser, and my question is that uh, this pattern of the agreement between PLO and Israel is creating a kind of unbalanced gains for the two parties. It gave a symbolic gains for the Palestinians, like recognition of PLO, while it left most of the substantial issues, like settlements, Jerusalem refugees, and other issues, under the control of the Israeli government. This unbalance or unequal balance of the, of the agreement represents the differential powers of the two parties. How do you, what's your assessment about the future negotiation and the continuation of the, the support for this agreement, especially on the side of the Palestinians, while uh, Israel uh, government can go to the public and say we didn't give nothing from our point of view. Uh, Arafat, when he goes back to the Palestinian, he can say we gained nothing because the refugees issue is still there, all open for discussions. Jerusalem is open, the settlements is open, the future of the Palestinian identity is open. Thank you very much. Well, it's, uh, it depends on how you look at it. The, the glass of water may be half full or half empty. It's half uh, full in the sense that for the first time ever in history, Palestinians who have been occupied for hundreds, if not thousands of years, now educate their own children, are responsible for uh, their own administration, even security, in a large proportion of the area. There are negotiations now which the outside world tries to speed up to enlarge self-rule to other parts of the West Bank, 
and there will be negotiations eventually on Jerusalem and on the future of the settlements. But I agree it's half empty in the sense that standard of living amongst uh, Palestinians have gone down and uh, the most important parts of, uh, of the West Bank and even elections have not taken place. We are behind the schedule of the Oslo Agreement. If you would go to Israel, you would see that the Israeli government is under enormous criticism for having provided a complete sellout of Israeli interests. They now have, uh, have uh, uncontrollable terrorist groups on their doorsteps. Uh, it is an open question what will happen with the settlements in Jerusalem and so on. So it depends a little bit wh where you stand, depends on where you sit in that uh, respect. I, um, I think you may have a point that it is a difference to be occupied or to be an occupier. So it will be like that. This school of negotiations can give you hundreds of examples. But I think that the Oslo Agreement is the best possible solution for both sides at this time in history. The alternative would be one more generation of hostility, and both sides would stand to lose. There would be no Palestinian self-rule, and there would be tremendous social revolt against Israel's occupation. Thank you. Let me go put a question while others are standing up. I think it, uh, one of the points that you made is the role of the press in this. Now, after having had as many visits uh, to Oslo as there have been, presumably the Norwegian press is a little more lively and alert uh, now as uh, odd people show up uh, at the airports. Uh, uh, would you talk to us a little bit about your dealing with the press, your uh, ability to mislead the press, uh, uh, how you feel about that, is it appropriate or inappropriate, and how uh, well you think you'll be able to do it in the future, given uh, that you can't fool them too many times, I presume. Well, I think um, maybe our strength as a small country, small administration, and the possibility to, to work closely with, with NGOs, uh, we can stay, we, we, we still have secrets. We, we, I, we have even contact between conflicting parties I cannot mention here, and I will not mention here, and will, which may remain secret forever. It's easier for us to keep secrets than it is for the State Department, certainly. It is easier for us. <laughs> but uh, one, some would say, claim it's an ethical problem that uh, I, as I alluded to, uh, if not lied, I misled the press. But I would say, uh, as some say, the Jesuits said uh, that the the means are justified by the, the goal. If we did not have a deniability, if we did not have secrecy, and if we did not build all these facades, uh, there would have been no secret Oslo channel, and they might have been negotiated in Washington still, and it would be a much worse situation in the territories. There would not be any peace agreement at all. My question concerns uh, not the two parties, but the third party, which is been very, very violent in, after the signing of the accord, and I'm talking about the groups which are called the terrorist groups out there. Uh, one straightforward point of view about them is that they happen to be terrorists, and therefore there should be an appropriate police response. The other is that they represent something deeper, uh, a yearning of the people, and therefore deserve to be brought into the negotiating uh, circle, as it were. My question is, do you think that Norway would like to engage these people in negotiation? And do you think it is the wise thing to bring them into negotiation, or just to have a common front to say that their tactics will, under no circumstances, be allowed to influence the course of the negotiations? The latter part of your question is the easiest to, uh, to answer. Their course of action, which are, which are violent terrorist actions, whether it be the, the uh, suicide bombers against Israeli buses or children and, 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 uh, and, and whatever, uh, or the massacre of, 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 of uh, Muslims in prayer in the, in the tomb of the patriarch in Hebron, they should not be allowed to influence a work, no. It would be to, 
it would, uh, it would mean that we would give in to violence uh, and terrorism. But on the other hand, all Palestinians, fundamentalist, secular, uh, whatever groups, should take place in the elections, which Israel should allow take place soon, meaning redeployment and withdrawal of forces from the West Bank and free and fair elections under international supervision. And here, I think there will be a fairly strong following, especially for Hamas, much less for jihad, the Islamic jihad groups. And I foresee that in the future, there will be a strong fundamentalist presence in the, pal in the Palestinian assembly, as there is now in the fairly strong in the Jordanian parliament uh, as such, but in a fair democratic system. Please. Let me get you to identify yourself, too, please. Hi, my name is Michelle Ledgerwood. I'm a graduate student here. My question is actually much more broad, um, and I hope not too broad. Um, I'd like to get back to Graham Allison's point that he made in introducing you regarding uh, your writings on Norway as a small state. Um, we, there is also a lot that has been written about the Norwegian history of benevolence, and you yourself spoke about the unique um, model that Norway has for NGO government cooperation. I would be curious to hear your theories on why Norway has been so successful in all of these different areas where other states have failed, and if there's potentially any possibility for applying this model in uh, other countries or other small states. Well, I, I really don't know whether we've been so much more, more successful, but it certainly is, in my opinion, and I, I wrote a book on this when I was in another university called Berkeley, uh, out west, uh, <laughs> where, which was called impotent, superpower, potent, small state. What I tried to tell the, there was that for a small country like ours, we have, where there is no strategic, military, not even trade interest conflicting with our humanitarian interests, it is easier for me to, to for us to be honest brokers uh, in an area. If, if uh, you're either a, a, a former colonial European power or you're the superpower of, the state, of this world, United States, there are more conflicting demands. The few cases where we have conflicting interests, we're not more moral than others. We give in to our own self-interest. But we're, we're very fortunate. We do not very often meet those things. At the, and at the same time, our, we have a foreign assistance budget which, which is a national consensus to provide, which is in uh, relative terms 10 times bigger than that of the average rich countries. And there are less restrictions on that. They are more, much more at the discretion of the government to use for demo democracy, human rights, foreign assistance, and, and so on. There is also very little interagency warfare between our ministries regarding foreign policy, between our various groups, we have a parliamentary system, which means that parliament uh, is there to support us, not uh, fight us uh, in, our, in uh, implying foreign policy, etc. So it is, it's easier for us to do this. Holland, Canada, Sweden, Denmark have done many of the same things. We have probably, over the last years, been doing more in preparing ourselves and in, in providing the tools, these preparedness agreements and so on, which means that if we decide today to help the guerrilla of Colombia and the government of Colombia who have asked us to do something in the possible peace process there, we could probably tomorrow send the first teams of Spanish-speaking observers, for example, and an airplane and the, the tools and setting up negotiations and so on through NGOs whom we would delegate responsibility to. So I think we have designed a quite a good system within uh, the uh, structure that we have as a small state. Good evening. Uh, my name is Hillel Alfred, and I appreciated your description of the uh, negotiations and mediation of the negotiating process. Um, although it sounded to me uh, that when you got to the work that needs to be done, um, that um, it seems that Israel has to do giving and Palestinians are re receiving. Could you comment or clarify on that, please? 
um, that Israel had to... It sounded to me like all the work that needs to be done is for Palestinians to receive. Hmm. No, uh, I, I wouldn't say that. I mean, <laughs> there are four parties which are at fault be because we are moving slower now than we should. It's the, in order of uh, priority perhaps, uh, yes, Israel uh, should, is the stronger party, it should withdraw uh, from the areas and, give, and, and, and provide more in the negotiations. But certainly the Palestinians must do even more to uh, defend Israeli civilians against terrorism. It is, uh, if, if you would go to the Israeli public today, they would feel threatened. There are more Israeli civilians killed over the last 15, uh, 18 months than in any preceding period or since 1967. More has been done on, on, uh, against uh, terrorism. More has to be done to set up an efficient Palestinian administration. It's going too slow, there's too much infighting, and so on. The donors have to give much more money for the recurrent costs of the Palestinian administration and, and provide disbursements earlier. Lots of countries, including the rich Gulf countries, are sitting on the fence watching this developed and not doing too much to make it develop correctly and, and in the right direction. And the UN and the World Bank have developed too slowly in, in terms of, of providing services for the average Palestinians. So there are four who have to give and take and receive and provide more, I think. Please. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew Yablon, and um, I was intrigued by this trade-off between secrecy and the success of the negotiations. One thing that concerns me is the possibility that um, because secrecy is so important that, uh, in fact, perhaps both sides are really not ready, despite the signing ceremony, to actually make peace. And I say that because when they go back to their respective constituents and they present to them the peace package, I get the impression that both the Israeli leadership and the PLO leadership is, is criticized quite severely and there's very little support, especially at this date, uh, remaining on both sides. And um, I'd wonder, I'm wondering if you would comment on your notion that secrecy is a good thing. It allows both sides to come together, but I think it might be, in the end, a bad strategy because you have a situation where both sides feel like they've been sold out by their leadership and perhaps a more, a more intense bitterness sets in than would have been there otherwise. Um, and I say this with a look towards the next 20 or 30 years into what's going to happen. I can take the point that it would probably have been better if the Oslo Declaration had been the Washington Declaration coming out of the open public negotiations. But nothing came out of the public negotiations in Washington as little as they came out of the Geneva uh, negotiations on the Balkans and so on and so forth. They would have been sitting there forever. And then the question is, is it, is it a net plus or a net minus that the leaderships agree on a package? I think it's a net plus. And the Israeli and the Palestinian public opinion, without any doubt, felt that, those, the, that the agreements were a, a net plus when they got to know them in September, October, November 1993. The, the opinion polls which were taken more scientifically in Israel than on the Palestinian side, but also on the Palestinian side, showed between 60 and 70 percent approval of the agreement. What's happened since then is that it, it's, lost, it's lost a lot of support in Israel because of the terrorist attacks, and it's lost a lot of support on the Palestinian side because of plummeting standards of living and more unemployment and so on. But the agreement, the Oslo Declaration, I think is widely accepted both in both public opinions as a start of these two peoples living together as, as, as uh, sisters and brothers, as, as neighbors uh, for the future. I think secret pact channels is something which has come to stay in these kind of negotiations, and they need to be accepted by, in a democratic way by the two peoples afterwards. The Oslo Agreement was voted upon in the Knesset, and there was a majority in favor. It was voted upon in the Palestinian National Council, as it's called, PLO Council, and it was also uh, passed with a wide majority. 
My name is Brian Palmer. I'm a PhD candidate here. Um, many of the courageous and creative Norwegian diplomatic efforts you've chronicled are reminiscent of a diplomatic tradition for which your neighbor Sweden is perhaps more famous. Did Sweden lose its internationalist role during its recent three years of conservative government? And second, uh, how does the Norwegian public uh, feel about Norway's new global leadership, which today certainly outshines Sweden? Uh, and third, um, third, do you, would you say that Norway's decision to remain outside the European Union, unlike Sweden, uh, may help Norway maintain its internationalist role? Um, thank you for your questions, uh, which I think will <laughs> be reported wide, uh, widely in the Norwegian press. Um, the, uh, certainly, you know, the relation with Norway and Sweden is like Canada and, and the United States, o only more so. What we, um, uh, what we did, uh, uh, yes, I mean, during the Palmer years of, of, of Sweden, they were involved in, in uh, several UN initiatives for mediation. But Sweden has been much more of the advocate of, of things against the Vietnam War to a very large extent and, and many other things. We are probably more of the quiet facilitator uh, than they, and at such it could be uh, some kind of a work split. And now uh, Sweden is coming much more actively, yes, with the new social democratic governments, and they, some say it's they try to copy us with an even a state secretary for peaceful settlement and conflicts, a big apparatus for supporting the Middle East peace process, etc. As regards the European Union, um, that is a, uh, it was a part of our referendum campaign whether Norway could have done what we did in the PLO agreement, Guatemala, all the other peace processes, as a partner in, as a member of the European Union. And I would say, yes, we can. I believe you heard uh, Mr. Lubos uh, in this forum one or two nights ago. Holland is uh, as active, nearly, as us in this area. And they are a European Union member. I was uh, meeting uh, Jan Pronk, the Minister of Development of Holland in Amsterdam just a few weeks back, and we created jointly the Friends of the Sudan Peace Process together, they as in the European Union country. We, I fought uh, hard together with my government that my country join the European Union. We were defeated in the referendum, and we will now try to make the best out of it. For the Middle East, maybe it, it's a... It's a if you ask people in the State Department, they like us not being part of the European Union, because then we can chair now the Dornan Consortium and try to mediate between the European Union and the United States, which is as difficult at times <laughs> as between PLO and the Israelis. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ron Fortgang, and I too am a student here at the Kennedy School and want to thank you for coming for this address. My question goes out of your, your comments about Norwegian involvement in, in water and refugee issues. And it's a question for the longer term. It is to what extent you really feel that back-channel diplomacy can interrupt or challenge or impede the, the public multilateral direct face-to-face -face, uh, realm of negotiations? I think uh, we should always, whatever we do behind the scene, it should be seen as supportive of and complementary to the official peace channel. I know that the official negotiators in Washington felt bad personally of spending a lot of time there in the final months when it was very clear that the respective leaders had their eyes on the Oslo uh, channel. Uh, but we even discussed uh, to a very large extent to just feed our whole package into the official process and presenting it as a, as a compromise in, 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 uh, in Washington. To some extent, that would be correct because the, the mother of our, of our negotiations was the official peace process. If it hadn't been an official peace process, there might not have been a back channel either. On water and refugees, uh, what we do on water is a direct product of the water group of the multilaterals. But the multilaterals are too heavy. These, uh, these ne the international multilateral negotiations, too slow, too heavy, too many people, too much press, 
too uh, much procedures to really reach the kind of, of, of comprehensive bilateral agreements which often have to be made. So there has to be combination, and, they, and we have to be su supportive then of the official negotiations. Can, can I just follow up and, and ask, do you think that- Very the, short question. Okay, very quickly. Do, do you think there's a danger though that, that back-channel diplomacy can become a cover or an out um, for, for folks who, or parties who are, are more concerned about the public um, approach? There, w there is one danger, yes, and that is that those who do not want an agreement may want several channels to be established to play one channel out against the other one and in the end producing no result in any of them. We've had, I won't uh, mention which ones, but we've had instances where we tested the back channel and immediately broke that because we knew it would actually create problems for the front channel. We're going to take the two last questions. Uh, my name is John Noyd. I was Moscow bureau chief of the Financial Times and now a visiting fellow at the Kennedy School. Um, I was enormously impressed by your presentation and more importantly by your achievement and I think the warmth of your reception was a sign that that's a general view. However, um, I have to say as a still working reporter, unlike you, uh, you've uh, succeeded in leaving it behind, um, I have to share Graham's queasiness a little about what you were saying. Um, the fact is, the facts as you say them were well, that AFP got the story right. Uh, so it would be interesting to know from which sources you say State Department sources which were unnamed. So presumably somebody leaked uh, what they knew was happening. So interesting to speculate who. Uh, but it, it, I mean, it does seem uh, to me that if, as you say, you are continuing on private negotiations, back channel negotiations with other parties, which you can't talk about. Sooner or later, my uh, colleagues are going to catch on to this, and they're going to say, uh, phone that state secretary guy. If he denies it, something is happening. Yeah. Uh, uh, so it may be that your usefulness is maybe um, limited. What, but what I wanted to ask particularly was, from what you said, there was extremely specific circumstances. First, that the, the Norwegian Labour Party had traditionally very close and good personal relations with the Israeli Labour Party. And then in the change of line in the 70s, you developed very good contacts with the Palestinians. Hence, both sides wanted you to put them in touch with the other. And clearly you were, as it were, peace entrepreneurs. You could, you could seize the chance when you saw it. Nevertheless, that, I would guess, is unlikely to repeat itself. Bring that in mind, how far do you think that experience is generalizable? How far could you or anyone in the other state take the, the role that you did? Or does it rely very heavily upon a specific series of events which go back decades? Yeah, I would answer you frankly. It's not very general, uh, generalizable, as, you, as was your word. Uh, we tried to apply it on this model of the PLO Israel model on an African conflict brought the government, very high level people, and the guerrilla movement to uh, one of the same uh, country houses uh, outside of Oslo said, now you sit in this room and we will be out in the other room and we, you call us and we will come with coffee or drinks or whatever and we can also provide you experts, but we would not want to be involved in the actual negotiations. As a mediator, we would be the facilitator. And they sat uh, for a while very quietly without saying anything, and then they started to shout at each other. And then they came and asked us to come in as a third party mediator. Uh, and it just showed it didn't work to try to, 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 to transform completely. What I think still is that there needs to be back channels in peace negotiations. Uh, whether they be corridor talks or in the same uh, channel or, or uh, same place as the official channel or proximity talks, indirect between whatever would be the messengers, it's up to the circumstances to, to decide. On, on the, the question of the press and so on, I think uh, uh, we will uh, uh, always be... Uh, what is important is that we try to not lie, uh, but at the same time uh, try to not uh, get the whole thing out, uh, because uh, in many of these instances, 
parties are not willing to start negotiations before they have tested the other side and see to see whether there's something there. And that's what we're doing in these other circumstances. The, uh, on the question of the leak, it's often been observed that the State Department is one of the few vessels that can leak from the top. So, <laughs> yeah, that would be the clue. Final question. My name is Hilda Silverman, and I very much appreciate your presentation and the work that you do and the work that you describe. So I apologize somewhat for ending on a negative note, but I go back to the first question and answer. And you talked about the glass being half full or half empty. This is a horrible mixed metaphor, but to me it seems to me as if the glass is hemorrhaging. And it's hemorrhaging because of something you didn't describe. You described the problem for Israel of the terrorism and the, tro the problem for the Palestinians of the declining living standard. But what I see in this interim period is enormous settlement expansion and enormous and I would say very negative changes in Jerusalem things that have specifically been put off for the final status uh, negotiations, but where Israel, as the stronger party, has not been precluded from taking action during the interim period. And to me, that is the thing that causes what I can only describe as a hemorrhage, and I'd like you to respond. On the, uh, on the settlements, yes, I think uh, that is, and I should have mentioned that more, more explicitly, the uh, two or 3,000 settlements which is now being developed uh, came, as you understand it, uh, out of a Supreme Court ruling that they would be, they would be legal uh, by the Israeli system. That's part of the old 10,000 settlements, which was a big dispute between Israel and the United States when the United States froze some assistance in the way in, 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 in some time back. Threatened, Def I believe. Hmm? I guess they froze some. Okay. Yeah. They, they, they froze for, for a while. Uh, I think uh, Sharon was the housing minister, and it was a, 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 a very hawkish period. What um, Palestinians feel is that their land is disappearing before their eyes as one is talking peace. Yes. Uh, and I would, if I was a, a Palestinian from uh, the just east of Jerusalem, I would uh, definitely feel the same. But at the same time, what's the alternatives? I mean, the alternatives is continued settlements and not even a peace process. I think, my, uh, to, to uh, end on a positive note, I think that before the 1st of July, we will have agreement on elections. We will have more redeployment of uh, West Bank areas. We will have Palestinians administration being expanded, this Palestinian police being expanded to new areas of the West Bank, and ultimately all the way up to the Jerusalem area. And then I think there will be very difficult negotiations on the settlements, and even worse negotiations on Jerusalem, which is symbol of, uh, really a symbol for both peoples. Um, but I think that we will see progressive uh, successive improvements. I think some settlements will have to go. I think some, there will be dismantling of, 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 uh, of, of uh, settlements even. And I think at the same time as we will see others come up in the, in the time to come. But uh, maybe, it's, uh, maybe, maybe you're right, but the alternative to this process is much worse. That's continued and even increased uh, confrontation. Thank you. If I, if, I, if I would just say on behalf of all of us, I think that, uh, as uh, John Lloyd has said, uh, entrepreneurs in uh, peacemaking uh, are to be uh, greatly admired to give a, for giving us uh, such a, a, a first-hand account of these events and for the accomplishments themselves. We say thank you very, very much, and we hope you come back. Thank you.